Chapter 6, Mr. Travis Cheats Us Out of a Great Lesson. It don't seem fair, but since the start of this, this year, Mr. Travis has been teaching us well, both everyday school and our Sabbath school classes. Sabbath school is Sunday school. And that means the man is on you like a tick. and You can't get away from him no matter where you go. The biggest problem is if he pegs you as being not particular bright in everyday school, you ain't got a prayer the first of having a clean slate when Sunday comes around and you got to go to Sabbath school. When Mrs. Guest was our school teacher and Mrs. Needham taught us Sabbath school, you had a better chance of fooling at least one of them into thinking you were sensical. But with Mr. Travis running both schools, you ain't nothing but a dead duck. What's even unfairer is that he mixes regular lessons up with Sabbath lessons. So they run one into the other and you can't tell which one is which one. I know that that ain't the way it's supposed to be because if it was, they wouldn't have regular classes at the schoolhouse and Sabbath classes at the church. I ain't trying to be disrespectful to teaching or teachers, but I've had enough classes with Mr. Travis to know that getting taught in the classroom just don't work. That ain't to say he can't force you to study something till it sticks in your mind for a while, because he can. But I don't care if you study on something all your life. It ain't going to stick like it if it happened to you personal. Ain't nothing made this point better than the lesson Mr. Travis had been pounding on us lately, both in regular class and Sabbath school. It started out because Cooter Bixby went and sassed Mr. Travis when he didn't know he'd done it and when he didn't mean to do it. I came to school on Monday and Cooter's waiting on me before the bell rung. He's sitting on the front steps of the school so antsy and twitchety that he looked like he's sitting on a hot stove. Something had him awful riled up and happy. I said, morning, Cooter. Morning, Eli. He jumped off the steps and pulled me over to the side of the schoolhouse so no one else could hear us. Cooter said, guess what? I seen Mr. Travis at the sawmill on Saturday. So? And he was acting more peculiar than he normal do. So? And we get to talking and I seen he's mighty upset about something. So? So the more he talked to me, the more upset he's getting for no cause at all. So when he finally leave, I'm standing there scratching my head, wondering what's plaguing him. What you figure it was? I couldn't make heads nor tails of it till a minute ago when I seen him going at the blackboard like a demon had a hold of him. Then finally I knowed what it was. Cooter, quit playing. What was it? He was acting so peculiar because of what he was planning on doing here at school today. What's that? Elijah, you ain't gonna believe what Mr. Travis is fixing to teach us about this morning. I won't gonna get myself worked up about none of Mr. Travis's lessons. I ain't trying to say I'm smarter than Cooter, but I notice things a little better and carefuler than him. And Mr. Travis ain't showed no signs at all that he could come up with any lesson that was worth getting this excited over. But if there was someone who weren't enthusiastic about his studies more than me, it was Cooter Bixby. So for him to be this riled up, maybe it was gonna be something, uh, something after all. I said, what's he gonna teach us? Cooter looked over both of our shoulders and whispered, take a peek in that window and look what he's written on the blackboard. You ain't going to believe it. I stood on my tiptoes and looked into our classroom. Mr. Travis didn't usually write nothing on the board till we'd been studying for a while and children had started getting drowsy and droopy. But today he'd written across the blackboard in letters big enough that you could have read them from Lake Erie in the fog. Familiarity breeds contempt. You could tell Mr. Travis was feeling real strong about this lesson. The words were underlined three times, and you could even see that he'd been mashing on the chalk so hard that it had busted clean in two a couple of places, and he had to commence his underlining all over again. It wasn't nothing to imagine Mr. Travis standing at the blackboard after he'd finished doing this writing, huffing and puffing with his eyes spitting fire. Doggone it all, maybe Cooter was right. I weren't too confident that he was going to know, but I asked him anyway. So, so what do those words mean? Cooter said, you don't know? I was kind of hoping you could tell me. But I'd done some thinking the way Mr. Travis has been telling us to. I matched up two of them words. I don't know with two words that I do know. What'd you come up with? 
Like I said, I ain't got too much notion what the first word is and last word mean, but I figure they ain't nothing but some fancy mumbo jumbo. But we both know what that word in the middle means, right? I must have been looking puzzled. Cooter said, Eli, you work in the stable. You got to know what. He checked over our shoulders again, leaned in real close and whispered in my ear. You just got to know what breeding is, right? You didn't need to work in a state, no stable to know what breeding is. I said, yeah. And Kuda said, and look at the first word, family arity. That look a powerful lot like it got something to do with family, don't it? It does. Kuda said, and the last word, contempt. It looks just about the same as contest, right? I guess so. So what's all that sum up to? I shook my head. Cooter whispered, come on, Eli, put it all together and it come up to family breeding contest. He's going to learn us about having a blank family breeding contest. No. What else could it mean? Cooter saw I want real convinced. He said, my pa said that Mr. Travis is from New York City and grown up free. And that's two reasons what folks should be suspicious about him for. Pa says him and them other grown folks was going to have to keep a sharp eye on what Mr. Travis tried to learn us. I said, so? Don't you see, Eli? Ain't no grown folks been checking up on Mr. Travis lately. So he thinks the coast is clear and it's safe for him to give us some of that stuff what Pa calls up north big city learning mess. It sounded peculiar at first, but if you started thinking like you didn't have no common sense at all, it seemed like Cooter had put it all together real good. Cooter saw I was starting to believe and said, in a family breeding contest don't count as some up north big city learning mess, I don't know what do. I couldn't help myself from saying, I'll be blamed. I know that's swearing, but compared to what our lesson was going to be about, swearing didn't seem like much of a sin no more. Cooter said, I just wish he hadn't gone and writ the lesson out on the board like that. What if that doggone Emma Collins or one of them other persnickety girls run off and tell someone what we're about to study. What if they stop this before he gets to the real interesting, real nasty parts? By the time the school bell rung, Cooter had me so worked up that I was looking like I was sitting on a hot stove too. We both knew something big was about to happen because instead of saying his usual regular, good morning scholars and strivers and questers for a better future, are you ready to learn? Are you ready to grow? The way he does every other morning, Mr. Travis was sitting at his desk holding on to his pointing stick. His eyes were closed and he was so hopping mad that it was a miracle that smoke weren't pouring from his ears. I know why, too. He must have figured out that once he taught us about family breeding contests, the grown folks were going to hunt him down and give him a good tar and feathering. I'd heard lots of talk about such things, but had never witnessed it myself. But I know if I ever ran into Mr. Travis again after this, I was going to have to apologize for spreading talk that he was a boring teacher. I was going to have to eat my blind words. Because could nothing in the world make you want to come to school more than learning about a family breeding contest than watching the teacher that taught it to you get covered in hot tar and run out of the settlement on a rail. We all settled down at our desks and waited. Even the children who didn't know what today's lesson was about sensed something went right and started looking at one another, all nervous and worrisome. Mr. Travis stood up and me and Cooter were about to bust with excitedness. Whoops. Gotta make that disappear. There we go. We are about to bust with excitedness. Mr. Travis brung that point and stick down on top of his desk so hard it was a miracle the desk didn't split clean in two. All the other children were taking this in a very terrific way. They were clenching onto the sides of their desks and looking as afeard as a horse that's seen a three-headed snake. Excepting for Mr. Travis's heavy breathing and the pointer sound echoing off the walls, the classroom was quiet as a dead squirrel. Only me and Cooter were smiling because we both know this was just the start of the best day of schooling we were ever going to have. I looked over at Cooter and he was looking just as happy as me. Mr. Travis opened his eyes and saw Cooter smiling away. And if I lived to be 50 years old, I hope I don't never witness another grown man go berserk like Mr. Travis did. It was a sight.
and a scar that'll be with me the rest of my life, right along with that trouble twixt me and Mr. Frederick Douglass. The adventure got going so quick like that I ain't sure of everything that happened, but all of a sudden Mr. Travis was howling like a wolf and jumping clean across the classroom and pouncing on Cooter Bixby like an owl on a rack. He moved so fast that Cooter didn't even have a chance to get the smile off his face before Mr. Travis jerked him out of his chair by the ear and marched him to the front of the room. I was shocked and couldn't have moved if I wanted to. Some of the other children weren't in as much shock as me, and as soon as Mr. Travis clamped down on Cooter's ear, they made a dash toward the doors. You can't blame them, neither. It ain't nothing in the world that can get you more frighted up than watching your Sabbath school teacher get took over by Satan and commence to twisting the juices out of children's ears, which is probably the first step the devil takes when he's about to wrestle your soul away from you. Before anyone could reach a door, Mr. Travis called out, Return to your seats this instant. Everyone stopped where they were at and commenced to head back to their desks, all except for Johnny Wells, who screamed like a hate had got a hold of him and jumped right out the window. Last I saw him, Johnny was tearing down the road toward a square, raising up little clouds of dust as he ripped along. A hate is another word for like a ghost or a scary spirit. Once everyone got sitting again, Mr. Travis kept a hold of Cooter's ear and shouted louder than you figured a proper man like him should. Our people are still enslaved and treated like animals. Cooter couldn't tell that Mr. Travis had lost his mind. He was still smiling and nodding. And I knowed why, too. Cooter ain't the sharpest tooth on the saw. And he must have figured that if we were going to get a family breeding contest lesson, then getting your ear pulled on a little bit weren't too much a price to pay. Like I said, I ain't trying to say I'm smarter than Cooter, but I do study on things a little better and carefuler than he does. And I could see there weren't going to be no kind of lesson on nothing till Mr. Travis was done dusting off Cooter Bixby and dusting him off good. It ain't no real sign that I'm a fragile boy, but now I was sitting like all the other children. My hands were gripping on tight to the side of my desk. My breathing was coming raggedy. My eyes were locked on Mr. Travis, wondering how long it was going to be before he got back in his right mind. And if his mind didn't come back to him, I was wondering whose soul he was going to grab next. Mr. Travis said, they are treated like animals. And though very a very few fortunate ones of us know the sweetness of freedom, unfortunately, another very very. And each time Mr. Travis said very, he gave Cooter's ear a good little twist. Very. Cooter's ear was getting wound up so tight that he started dancing on one leg, trying to get some of the pressure off it, but he was still smiling. Very. I couldn't stand it no more. Why, if Mr. Travis kept on twisting Cooter's ear like that, when he did turn it loose, it'd be spinning and unwinding itself on the side of Cooter's head for a whole week. I didn't care if it draw attention to me or not. Cooter's my best friend, and I knowed he'd do the same for me. I took in a deep breath to buck up my courage and finally raised my hand and yelled out, Mr. Travis, sir, please forgive me for talking out in class, but I just got to let Cooter know if he don't quit smiling, sir, he's going to end up getting that ear ripped right off from the side of his head. Cooter heard me through his other ear and catched on to what a bad spot he was in. Finally, he stopped smiling and started in howling. But Mr. Travis gave him a couple more varies anyway. Very, very few of us don't have an appreciation of whence we have come. Cooter yelled, I appreciate it, I appreciate it. Mr. Travis said, oh, you do. Cooter screamed, oh, sir, you can't know how much I do. Mr. Travis said, and where, may I ask, was your appreciation for that fact this Saturday passed at the sawmill? You could tell Cooter didn't have no kind of answer, but something about getting your ear twisted must make your mind work real clear. Cooter said, I'm sorry. I don't know what I've done, but I'm powerful sorry, sir. Mr. Travis eased back a notch on Cooter's ear and tells him, read what's on the blackboard, Mr. Bixby. Cooter didn't even look. He called out, it's a family breeding contest, sir. He couldn't help but notice a surprised look on Mr. Travis's face, so he decided he'd best add some more. He said, and I don't care what happens, sir. I ain't going to breathe a word to no one if you teach us about that. But look at them there, girls. You know Emma Collins is going to snitch. Mr. Travis commenced to twisting on Cooter's ear some more. 
he told Emma, Miss Collins, read what I've written on that blackboard. Emma jumped up like she sat on a tack and said, Sir, it says, familiarity breeds contempt, sir. Then Emma started in with her bawling. Me and Cooter both were surprised at this. Not about Emma bawling. That girl will cry if you ask her what's two and two. We were surprised that Emma Collins, being as smart and fragile as she is, would be brave enough to call them words right out in front of everyone. Miss Collins, you may be seated. Mr. Bixby, do you understand what that means? Kuda thought on it for a second and then said, Well, sir, I thought I did, but now I'm thinking that maybe Elijah gave me some bad information. I couldn't believe it. I'd help save Cooter's ear, and the first chance he got to throw me to the wolves, he did it. Mr. Travis said, It's quite obvious you have no idea. It means, once a person, let's say a person like you, Mr. Travis went back at the ear twisting. Once a person feels too comfortable around someone who is his elder or his superior or his teacher, Kuda went back to howling. That person has a tendency to not treat his better with the respect that's due. Kuda got to it now. What did I do, sir? I didn't do nothing. Mr. Travis said, that's exactly it, Mr. Bixby. You did nothing. When you met me at the sawmill, you did not remove your hat when you walked up to me and spoke. You did not wait until I was finished talking to Mr. Polite. You did not address me in a proper manner. Cooter said, but sir, I was surprised and happy to see you. I didn't say nothing but, hey, Mr. Travis. Mr. Travis' mind left him again, and he started whining Cooter's ear back up. That's it? Hey? 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 Now, hey was the word Mr. Travis used every time he gave Ooter's ear a crank. Hey! Last time I checked, Mr. Bixby, hey was for horses, not for one's instructor. I've grown angrier and angrier. You are so fortunate to be freed from the yoke of slavery. You have this wonderful opportunity to improve who you are. And instead, you choose to behave toward me in a manner one would expect of a poor, ignorant soul who has lived his entire life in bondage. It was about this time the door flew open and Mr. Chase came busting in, bursting in, busting in, toting a broad axe and dragging a screaming, kicking Johnny Wells behind him. Johnny was yelling, please, sir, don't make me go back in there. He already killed Cooter Bixby. Mr. Chase looked around the classroom, saw Mr. Travis, brung his axe down, then said to Johnny Wells, if you ever drag me out of the fields over some nonsense like this again, boy, I'm going to hide you, then give you to your pa so he can do the same. Do you see any hints in here? Do you see any, anyone was dead in here? Mr. Chase pulled off his cap and looked back at Mr. Travis, twisting and cooed a dancing and said, I give you my regrets for coming in here like this, sir. You can carry on with your lesson." Things got pretty bad after that. We didn't learn nothing about no family breeding contests, and Mr. Travis commenced to handing out lines as punishment and licks as reminders. I got three swats and had to write familiarity breeds contempt 25 times for speaking out in class and for providing Cuda with bad information on what it meant. Johnny Wells got five swats and had to write it 50 times for running off and snitching on a teacher. Cooter got 10 licks and had to write it 125 times for being what Mr. Travis called riddled with disrespect for his superiors. Unfairest of all, since Cooter was my best friend, I knowed I was going to have to help him out, so I'd probably end up writing 50 of his doggone lines myself. I know the reason why Mr. Travis went and made us write all them lines and passed, them, passed out all them swats is because he was trying to make the Familiarity breeds contempt less and stick. But classroom learning just don't work the same as when something happens to you personal. That ain't to say that the lesson ain't going to be with me for the rest of my life, but it don't have a thing to do with Mr. Travis, because it wasn't about a few days later that the lesson got taught to me in a way that can't help but last forever. That brings us to Chapter 7. Mr. Leroy shows how to really make a lesson stick.